editor of Cal Matters. We are a nonprofit news organization. Actually started about four years ago in Sacramento and covering all the state issues, uh, all the major state issues in California. Um, we are very happy to co-host this event uh, with the Los Angeles Times. And we're very proud to uh, be working together on the podcast we're about to hear today um, about affordable housing called Gimme Shelter. Um, the, so one, of the, one thing I wanted to ask is how many people have heard the podcast? Wow, you guys have quite a following. I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you all know uh, a bit about what to expect and a peek behind the scenes here today. This is our first, uh, the first live of broadcast of, of Gimme Shelter. Um, and you probably know that Matt and Liam have, I think, done for the wonky issue of affordable housing, kind of what Click and Clack did for auto repair. <laughs> no, uh, I was... I was listening to the latest episode on the train coming in today from Sacramento, and I was thinking, you know, for those who know the podcast really well, a good um, trivia question would be, you know, like, who was the assembly member who Liam referred to as a human shrug emoji? <laughs> <laughs> A, there's bonus, yeah, but <laughs> there's people who know the answer, right? <laughs> um, so uh, one thing, a couple quick announcements before we get started. I want to thank our sponsor, LMH Consulting, uh, who does, does fine work on uh, health, health consulting and health issues and health reform. And uh, LMH would, Consulting would also like to recognize the Hope Cooperative, which has done work with uh, housing for mental health and supportive housing for nearly 40 years in Sacramento. So a big thank you to LMH Consulting. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the Public Policy Institute of California, where we are today. This is the location of our event. And, um, and uh, I actually used to work there, and so did Matt, and work here. And welcome to all the PPIC people here. Um, and with that, let me turn the program over to our, to our hosts. Uh, Matt Levin is the housing and data reporter at Cal Matters, and Liam Dillon is the housing reporter at the Los Angeles Times. So over to you guys. Well, uh, thanks for coming out, everybody. Welcome to the first live version of Gimme Shelter, the California Housing Crisis podcast. This is weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Try to pretend like, is my mic on? Oh, I think you might have to okay. turn it on. And we, we unfortunately, we won't be able to edit this one because it's live, <laughs> Liam. So. Uh, so we should just pretend like there's nobody here. Yes, okay. that would be ideal. So okay. this is especially weird for me because I actually did my intern presentation right in this building. <laughs> and my boss for that presentation is sitting right there. So <laughs> hopefully this goes much better than that. Um, <laughs> So uh, normally when we intro the podcast, actually Dave stole a little bit of thunder, uh, we introduce ourselves and then we talk about the topic that we have today. And today's topic, as journalists, we love to talk about problems. Um, it's our favorite thing to do to point out how depressingly awful everything is and housing is a perfect beat for that. It's really easy. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's very easy. Um, but today we're talking about solutions. Teeing you up, buddy. Great. Uh, <laughs> so we have three wonderful guests here to talk about solutions. We uh, are going to go one by one uh, and call them up after we do a little brief intro on kind of setting the table, setting the stage for the problem. Uh, Oakland Mayor Libby Schaff. Okay. <laughs> and then we'll have uh, Margot Cashel. She's a direct, the director of the UCF, UCSF Center for Vulnerable Populations and UCSF Benioff Homeless and Housing Initiative. <laughs> and then our third guest is Candice Gonzalez. She is the chief housing officer at Sand Hill Property Company. Um, so normally with the podcast, um, we have the most popular segment in all of California housing podcastry, which is a very limited universe <laughs> where I think we're the only one. Yeah. Statewide, at least. Sure. It is. The avocado of the Fortnite. And the, the full background of this is there was an Australian developer um, who said that the reason that millennials can't afford to buy homes is because they spend all their money on uh, avocado toast, which, of course, is empirically true. Yes. Um, objectively true. Researchers at PPIC have run a regression <laughs> proving that the price of avocado toast is the determining factor in home ownership. So... 
Uh, we thought we'd keep it really basic with this one to kind of set the stage, and we will be talking about problems right now. You wanna you wanna lead it? I- so um, it's really expensive to buy a house in. California, the median uh, home value is over six hundred thousand dollars right now, uh, and that is more than twice the national average. So it's something special about California, unfortunately. Yeah, so you could pretty much like bogo a uh, that it should be a state deal where you buy a California house and get a house in some other part of the country for free. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, this data is actually. As of yesterday, a little old. Uh, we just reached another all-time high. If you trust the data from the California Association of Realtors, the median price of a home statewide is six hundred seventeen thousand dollars. Which I know when we do this stuff in the Bay, it's less of a people aren't <laughs> appalled by that. They're like, "Oh my God, what a bargain!" Right. Um, but everywhere else in the country, people are like, "That's ridiculous." Yeah. All right. And it's not just high housing costs, um, it's also (laughs) rising homelessness. Uh, California has, uh, while being 12% of the nation's population, has more than a quarter of the nation's uh, homeless population, and the numbers are rising, as we saw uh, this past year. Um, San Francisco, up 30%. Oakland, up 43%. LA County, up 12%. Uh, so that 130,000 number um, of uh, in our homeless population is last year. So the number almost certainly this year will go up significantly. Yeah. Um, and we're going to identify one more big problem here, um, which is California does not build housing like uh, we used to. Um, so uh, I'm just realizing now that the podcast version of this will not have the slides. Yeah. <laughs> so well, I'll, I'll, we, we'll describe this as much as we can. can do that. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. So um, this is actually a stat that's probably very familiar to many of our listeners. But, you know, the state housing department says we should be building 180,000 units a year um, to just keep pace with demand. As you can see by this chart, we are well short of that. And uh, in 2019, we've actually taken a dip. Somewhat surprisingly, we're at, you want to take it? Yeah, it looks like we're going to be going below 100,000 new units, which is uh, really the wrong trend, given that we're, you know, after emerging from the recession, as you can see, a real, you know, the lowest number on record here is 2009. So since then, we've been on a steady, relatively steady upstream, uh, but it looks like we're going to take a step backward in 2019. And that's, of course, bad. Uh, Also, uh, people in the room, uh, but we'll describe this for the podcast audience as well. We'll Glad you noticed this. In the upper right, there's a little picture there, and that's the governor, Gavin Newsom. Um, (laughs) And uh, almost off the page where uh, he has called for the building of 500,000 units uh, every year for the next seven years to not only meet demand, but also um, make up for previous uh, underbuilding. And you see how uh, gruesomely far off we are from that from yes. that number. I made this. It is not exactly to scale, but um, <laughs> it's pretty, it, it, pretty it makes a page. point. Yes. 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 Um, okay. So uh, enough with the depressing tour of California housing statistics that I'm betting most of you are actually uh, well acquainted with anyway. Um, let's talk about solutions. And that's great. And why don't we start with our first guest, Mayor Libby Sheff. So I'm, I'm here to both de-wonkify and solve the housing crisis, yes. right? Yes, you're the best person, I'm sure. To That's do why we brought things. you. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so why don't we start? Um, Oakland has done a lot of building in previous years, and this year it seems to be on pace for more than San Francisco even. Uh, is that that's correct for yeah. a long time? Yeah, it's very exciting. We're actually building more than San Francisco. Uh, it's still not enough, and not enough of it is protected affordable housing for our lower income workers and families, our most vulnerable folks that we really have got to take care of. But you cannot say that Oakland is not building. I've got cranes in the sky to <laughs> prove it. Uh, so what have you done to make it easier to build? Well, we've done a bunch of things. I mean, we we put forward this 17K, 17K plan uh, about three years ago. So I can tell you the before and after from, you know, both the implementation and launch of that plan. And and the point is, it's not just about producing more housing. We also have got to protect people in the housing they have right now. Uh, I know you want to focus on production, but let us... Everything. Okay, talk well... Talk about everything. Let's, let's talk about everything. <laughs> everything. And that's, I mean, you know, obviously if it was simple, it would be solved. It is 
recognizing that it's not just one thing. Um, so our philosophy was we had to both protect people, and that means strengthen our rent control and our just cause eviction laws. And it's so exciting that the state of California is actually helping in that instead of hurting with that. You know, Costa Hawkins is a state law that limits a city's ability to actually um, protect its own tenants. Um, and yet this year they actually gave us a bit of a gift with an anti-rent gouging and just cause eviction protection for the whole state. A lot of people said it couldn't be done. I think it's pretty exciting. Uh, we also want to recognize that we have to protect existing affordable housing. And that means being aware, sometimes affordability protections expire. And so to be aware of that, to make sure that those um, units remain protected, affordable, and that's, you know, a legal restriction. I'm trying to de -wonkify. I'm not doing a very good job. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay. Um, and then it also means in cities like Oakland, you know, we actually went to our voters and we said, you know, we've got a housing crisis. Would you be willing to pay more taxes to help address it? And God bless the voters of Oakland. They said yes. And I mean, we also promised to fix their potholes that helped to get that measure passed as well. You know, uh, sometimes we wrap these things together. Right. Yes, I see a pothole fan in the audience. Yeah, I know. I know those streets are bad. Those streets are bad, especially if you're a bike rider. But um, I, I think it's good to say that Californians recognize that this is an issue that affects everybody. And if there is one thing to kind of de-wonkify this, if you own a home, you are not isolated from this crisis. You know, you may think you have yours and this is not affecting you. It is affecting you. You know, I, I always think about my, um, my son had this great teacher. She, she went out and like researched math clubs that he could join. I mean, she was just amazing. And I was so excited uh, at the idea that my younger daughter was going to have her, but she had already moved out of the Bay Area. The whole year she had been teaching my son, she was couch surfing. Wow. She was never able to find a place to live. The, the traffic jam that you're in, the, the time that you can't find a senior caretaker for your aging parents, like this is affecting you, whoever you are, you people that don't eat avocado toast. <laughs> this is affecting you. And it's not just a matter of building. It's also changing the way that we occupy our housing. I know, I'm sure you're going to ask me about single family zoning. I'm excited to talk about that. But Oakland, <laughs> Oakland has both uh, raised its own local bond issues to build and acquire affordable housing. It has also changed the laws to make it a lot faster to build. We've done area-specific plans where we've actually done the environmental clearance. Right. We've upzoned to make uh, to reward density and and tall buildings. I like tall buildings. Who's not? Who doesn't like tall buildings? They're beautiful. <laughs> um, and and those are the that's the kind of environment that we've created, which clearly has done its job because in the last three years, we've built more than 10,000 new units of housing and probably double that in our pipeline. So um, you referenced the cranes and you um, spoke of them with praise. I lived in Lake Merritt um, and I... In the lake? It must have been a little wet. That's all I could afford, Mayor Chad. <laughs> um, and I, this was a few years back, but I would see those cranes and I would see those high rises going up. Um, and I, the thought that would occur to me was, how is that helping me? I'm a renter. I'm in a, a unit that is not rent controlled. Um, how is that going to help me? And I think that speaks to the political problem that someone like yourself has to address. So how do you address that? Okay, well, after I dried you off a little, <laughs> um, it helps you in two ways. First of all, new people are moving to Oakland. I mean, you know, I always, always say we're like the, teenager that just got her braces off. We've always been cute, but suddenly everybody has noticed us. Uh, so people are coming and we're Oakland. We welcome all. We do not believe in walls. Just ask a certain person. Um, so we welcome people. If I don't build new housing for the new people, they are going to push you out and price you out of the lovely uh, Lake Merritt apartment you have today. That is a rule of supply and demand. We are under demand. We have got to address supply. The second thing that you should celebrate about those cranes is as part of our 17K, 17K plan, and, and honestly, it was in the works before, we adopted impact fees for the first time. And so we charge a fee because we recognize that market rate units create a need for protected affordable units. And so developers either have to include 
protected affordable units in those new buildings, or they have to uh, write a nice big check to our affordable housing fund. And just to, again, in the spirit of de-wonkifying, when we say protected affordable, it means that these units by law are only available to people that make under a certain amount of the median income and the rents are set to be no more than 30% of that low income renter's income. Okay. Just in case people yeah. did not know that. That's good. That's good. Um, so an idea that's come up around the state, but one that's already been implemented in Oakland uh, is this idea of taxing vacant property. Um, you supported that. Um, how's that working? Well, it's a little early to tell. Yeah. Um, the actual kind of regulations are coming out, uh, coming in front of the council in a couple weeks. Uh, I'll you know, be honest, it, it caused a lot of angst. But I do like the fact that we are identifying what we believe the problem is, and we are putting a cost on that. And so if you live in the Bay Area and you are not utilizing your land, shame, shame on you right? That we just talked about supply and demand. We have a huge amount of demand right now. So if you have land, if you have an apartment that you're just holding it as an investment and nobody is living there, that is a terrible waste of an incredibly valuable resource. And so conceptually, I like it. The devil will be in the details. We have no idea how much money it's going to generate. We anticipate $10 million a year, but um, you know, you all, all the other jurisdictions can benefit from Oak Oakland's bravery, because we're out there first, and we'll let you know how it goes. And isn't it a sign of success that you actually don't generate as much money as you would hope, because that means people are putting the land to use, or the, the property to use? Well, again, that remains to be seen. There are about 10 exceptions. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, is this really a vacant land tax, or is it not? Yeah. I think people will ask us that question, but let's see. And there may be good reasons, uh, environmental reasons, et cetera, hardship reasons. Um, we, we don't want people to hate their government. We want them to love their government. So we really do need to be thoughtful as we roll out laws like this. Uh, do you know of any property owner, owner that has sold their uh, vacant lot um, as a result of the tax? Or You know, those have not come to my attention. The people that are really pissed off, those are the ones I know about. <laughs> <laughs> it's often the case. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, the city, one area where Oakland is struggling is in producing subsidized housing for low-income residents. Um, city's fallen short of its own goals. What's been the big, biggest obstacle to doing so? Money, money, money. Um, you know, and I, I want to, again, you know, love on the people of Oakland. Unlike some communities, we don't have a lot of public opposition to affordable housing. Uh, we have a lot of political will in our city council, in our planning commission. So I love you people. You're great. Uh, we don't have enough money. And even when we put out the 17K, 17K plan, we identified a number of subsidized, protected, affordable units that we knew the city needed, and we acknowledged in our plan that our plan was not sufficient to reach that goal. Hmm. Now, there have been some encouraging signs so far. One thing I'm really excited about, and I do not know how I'm going to de-wonkify this, but uh, the legislator, legislature just approved a regional affordable housing financing authority for the Bay Area. And there are a couple things I love about that. Um, one, it really continues to send the message that we are all in this together. Um, while I love uh, dissing on Cupertino, and I think you'll get a chance to do that later, um, that's, but that's an example. Like You, you cannot think that, that your city can add jobs and the people will live somewhere else. We have to see just how interconnected we are. We have to see our regional nature. And so just the fact that it's a regional authority is exciting, but it gives us a whole bunch of tools to start generating revenues specifically for affordable housing. Because when... And I, and I don't know how you de redevelopment, but redevelopment was a tool that allowed us to take property taxes and dedicate them for public, um, for, for affordable housing. In fact, when you saw that chart, you saw that the huge fall off on housing protection happened to coincide with the, around the same time that redevelopment was taken away uh, from city's toolboxes for financing affordable housing development. I, I don't know if that's a coincidence or more. 
Um, so regionalism has been kind of a, a buzzword in uh, Bay Area housing circles for quite some time. Uh, it feels like uh, we haven't uh, really reached the level of regional cooperation that uh, many of the local politicians here would like. What do you think is the biggest obstacle to that? And are there other regions in the state or the country that you think are, you know what, they're actually making it work? Uh, I think we've got to take away this obsession with local control. Um, there are a lot of places where people's understanding of the uniqueness of their community is worth lifting up, but we cannot sacrifice regional responsibility for local control, especially when so many communities have a legacy of uh, racially uh, exclusion, race, race exclusion covenants, redlining. I mean, there is a lot of bad stuff. I'm not swearing because your thing told me not to. <laughs> a lot it, of bad fine. stuff yeah. uh -huh. that government has done and allowed to be done. Uh, and so I think that alone is a good reason to start thinking. But I mean, who works, lives, and plays exclusively within the boundaries of one city. I mean, I'm the mayor of Oakland, and even I sneak out from time to time. <laughs> so, um, obviously, Oakland faces real gentrification and displacement pressures. What have you found works, and what have you found doesn't work to um, combat those issues? Uh, what I find works is building more housing. And again, I, I've been frustrated when activists, or you know, I call it, you know, NIMBY sh wolves in progressive sheep clothing. Um, you know, when NIMBYs masquerading as progressives uh, say we shouldn't develop, we shouldn't build new housing, uh, they are really hurting the very cause that they are purporting to serve. So when you have gentrification, again, it means new people, wealthier people are moving into your community. If you build no, new places for them to move into, you don't get displacement. But you have to couple that. You can't pretend that that's going to happen automatically. You have to couple that with really strong protections for your existing tenants. And Costa Hawkins, I'm, I'm just saying it, has really been frustrating. For a city like Oakland, where rent control only applies to units built before 1983, which, by the way, is the year I graduated from high school, <laughs> um, it, you know, you're missing a whole lot of housing. Now, the exciting thing about the anti-rent gouging bill is that covers anything that is older than 15 years. It's a rolling um, standard. I think that's what makes sense. I think that's what uh, how people should actually amend Costa Hawkins. Uh, so you still encourage new construction, but you protect people. This is home. This is not some commodity that you buy and sell. It's your complete sense of security and community. And it is very appropriate for government to regulate it more. So you mentioned the rent cap as a bulwark against gentrification. I'm wondering if there's um, any part of the rent cap that you would tweak or change or that you think needs to be improved that would help Oakland. Um, listen, it, it was not as aggressive as I would have liked, but I am a big believer in do not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, I will be honest with you, you know, as someone who was involved with the CASA process, and I know we're not supposed to use acronyms, but it was a year and a half process, uh, a regional process of people that generally are at odds with each other, like kind of the equity advocacy community and for-profit developers, you know, labor and business, everybody at one table saying how the... I'm not swearing. Are we going to solve the Bay Area's housing crisis? And... And, you know, people lost their appointments on MTC over this thing. It was very controversial. And so the fact that our legislature actually passed an anti-rent gouging law and statewide just cause eviction, I'm celebrating that. I'm not going to nitpick it. I could, but I'm not going to. Um, Can't make me. I, I, was, I, was, I was not luring you into, into any type of trap there. I, I, I've been derelict in my uh, MC duties. I just wanted to uh, remind everyone, you will have a chance to ask questions. I just realized this at the, at the end. Um, we're going to pass around note cards. You can write your question on the note card and signal them up here, and then we'll have people to collect them. So you will be able to ask Mayor Schaff questions. Um, uh, after. Bring it. I'm from, I'm from Oakland. I can take it. <laughs> so, uh, 
Oakland does. We saw the homelessness numbers um, uh, earlier. And I actually have to correct you. Okay. It's Alameda, Alameda County, County, County had a 43% yeah. yeah. increase. Yeah. Oakland, County. Oakland had a 47% increase. So um, my understanding is that makes Oakland the city with the, the largest per capita homeless population in the state. Um, why is that? Well, with um, San Francisco style, you know, revitalization and wealth and, you know, came, came these problems. And it, it is literally the most heartbreaking issue that any uh, elected leader has to contend with. You know, these, and, and I, I just, I think it's very important to start the myth busting immediately about our homeless problem. Uh, in Oakland, more than half of our homeless grew up in Oakland. I mean, we have maybe roughly 20% who were not last housed inside Alameda County, but and that also means some of them were housed in Richmond or San Francisco. I mean, we're just talking about the county. These, these are our neighbors. And research shows that traditionally, you know, mental health, substance abuse, these have always been drivers of homelessness. But what we're seeing now is that homelessness is literally caused from a lack of housing. People lose their housing in the Bay Area. They have other ties. Many of them work, but they cannot afford to find new housing once they've lost it. It is heart-wrenching. So what in your experience works the best in terms of preventing homelessness and then also rehousing people? And also that falls under your control. Well, I gave up... Um, just trying to work on, on things that are under my control. <laughs> um, and, you know, that is part of the issue. Because homelessness is as complex as individuals are, it is not something that is well served by the silofication, I don't know if that's a word, Good of, word. of yeah. government. Okay, um, because cities tend to deal with the public right of ways, the parks, the sidewalks, the streets, the garbage collection, counties deal with public health, mental health, substance abuse, behavioral health. Uh, the federal government, God bless them, um, is supposed to be uh, through HUD, providing housing vouchers and, and helping with public housing and financing shelters. And, and there is a, quite a disconnect right now. Your next guest is going to do a far better job than I can about what works. But I can tell you there are three things that we must be vigilant about at all times. And I always fear that one of them um, is probably the sexiest for mayors to work on. And it can't be at the expense of the other two. So First and foremost, we have to prevent people from falling into housing, uh, homelessness. And in Oakland, we've really found um, that it is incredibly cost effective to keep someone in the housing they have. Um, I always talk about Deborah Ross is this incredibly exuberant woman. She sells these crazy customized hats. And I could not have been more pleased to find out she was one of the very first people helped by our initiative, Keep Oakland Housed, which is a partnership with Kaiser and Crankstart and um, San Francisco Foundation that, first of all, provides immediate emergency financial assistance. I mean, Deborah was $800 behind in her rent. But she had gotten an eviction notice, and she was the caretaker for her grandson. That's all it took for Deborah, eight hundred dollars. That is cost effective. Other people need legal assistance. They need case management to ensure that they can remain stably housed, and that's all part of the set of services Keep Oakland House provides. We then have got to get people off the streets and into safety and shelter faster. And I have been really pleased. Oakland tried this crazy thing that people made a lot of fun of me <laughs> about, and that was um, we put people in tough sheds. Now, we've evolved that model tremendously. It's now, we call it the community cabins model. Uh, it has been very successful. The outcomes are amazing, and it's about half the cost of a San Francisco navigation center. And then finally... Version of a shelter. Yeah. 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 But it's a year round. It's not the traditional congregant shelter. Uh, and I just, I just got this statistic before I came here, and it just shocked me. Yeah, you know, we just had our first rain of the year yesterday, right? Last night, my congregant shelter, and it's, it's a year-round shelter. It's not just um, emergency. It's a year-round shelter at St. Vincent de Paul's. Only had an 
occupancy rate. I had 11 empty beds in this shelter, and I had 100 people sleeping outdoors within a one block radius of this shelter. So why? Because we cannot force people to come indoors. We have to create conditions that actually provide safety and services for them and that as adults, they will choose to come into. And that's one of the things that's been so successful about the community cabins model is it's been really attractive because people go to bed at night behind a locked door with their partner, their pets, and their possessions in privacy. And even though it's, it's porta potties, it's a shower truck, it's, it's very not fancy, that privacy, that dignity is really meaningful for people. But the last thing we've got to do is have permanent, affordable places for people to live out the rest of their lives. We have to do all three of those things. So we were on a stage together in the spring uh, and I asked with you and a couple other mayors from the Bay Area, hey, what do you think about single family only zoning, home only zoning? Do you want to eliminate it? And you said, yes. So is it eliminated in Oakland? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. It takes a second. Yeah. That was just, you know, like how many weeks five ago? Months, five, five months? months? Yeah, roughly. Oh, it feels like yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yes, yes, yes. Um, there are some things that for cities to do take a lot longer because we have to do an EIR and environmental analysis, da 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 And that's why when the state does it, it is so much faster. That's why I'm still kind of waiting for SB 50, which is, you know, Scott Wiener's bill that would kind of streamline and speed up housing production, especially around good transit. I'm waiting for that to come out of its medically induced coma <laughs> and, and, and maybe pass. Because while Oakland would do that, we, we would actually make those zoning changes. It would take us three years, whereas the legislature could really do it in three weeks. So that's the kind of thing. And, and before people freak out that eliminating single family um, home zoning means that some horrific tower is going to be built next to your backyard, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about you know, neighborhoods like Rockridge. Who doesn't love Rockridge in, Oak in Oakland? I mean, on one street, you'll have a single family home next to a duplex, next to a triplex, next to a single family home. We're talking about not necessarily changing the envelope of structures. We're talking about allowing more people the opportunity to come into these neighborhoods. These neighborhoods are healthier. They have better public schools. They have lower crime rates. They um, often have histories of racial exclusion that we need to really interrupt and change. And those are some reasons that I think this type of movement is good. Now, Oakland has made it a lot easier to um, build accessory dwelling units. In other words, we love grannies. Grannies, come to Oakland. Um, we actually built more new um, ADUs in Oakland over the last few years than San Francisco or San Jose. So clearly making it easier does impact the supply. And that's, that's kind of a way of, of nudging that single family home mentality along. So we're going to uh, end uh, magic wand with question. magic wand question. So you, we're going to ask everyone this question, but we'll, we'll start. Uh, last question for you, Mayor Schaff. You're the emperor of California. And you can, I would be empress. Empress of California. And you can change one thing overnight to fix California housing. What is it? Just one thing to fix housing? One thing. It's, a, it's a, well, like a genie, but only one, uh, one wish. Cheap genie. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's so mean because that's counter to my entire, <laughs> um, you know, what I said to you that it's complex. It's a whole bunch of different things. I guess I would want to change how we um, fiscalize land. We have a very limited supply of land. Um, the fact that so much profit can be associated with it when we are providing a basic human need, which is housing a home, um, I think there is something in there that, that has to be fixed. So one way of interpreting that very quickly is reforming Prop 13 in some way. Oh, yes, yes, and yes, yes, yes. I'm a big supporter of the, the 
pending uh, measure. I know people are out gathering signatures. Please support them. Please send them your checks. Sign their petitions. Um, this is something that is truly broken for California. And frankly, one way to think about this is remember this particular Prop 13 reform does not change the tax rate for housing. It doesn't change it for housing. It changes it for Chevron. It changes it for corporations that do not die, and so they can own a piece of property forever. Uh, and so, you know, when Prop 13 was passed, commercial and industrial property carried a much larger load of property, of total property tax contributions than residential property. It's time to return that appropriate balance. All right. Uh, let's All right. thank Mayor Schaff. Well, we're going to have her stay to... to uh, to take pot shots at, at our next guest, uh, but we'll, we'll now introduce uh, Dr. Margot Cushell. Thank hey. you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll start out, uh, to, to kind of this is a question that's scene setting about you. So you and your research recently received a $30 million grant uh, from Salesforce founder Mark Benioff and, and his wife uh, this year to fund your research on housing and homelessness. And so this is a bit of a snarky question to begin yeah. with, but why shouldn't we just take $30 million and build a bunch of houses instead? <laughs> yeah, totally fair question and not the first time I've heard it. So. First of all, I think um, there's a little bit of a misconception of what we're trying to do. Most of the money will not go to sort of research or research as it's usually been done. We've been doing a great job of getting research funding from the NIH and other places who pay for research. What we have noticed is this big gap between what we know and what actually happens. And so a lot of the funding will be used to try to translate what we already know or to get more, more information about what we need to know to what actually happens. And I guess my answer to that is, this is a problem on the scale of many, many billions of dollars. Um, it costs about $700,000 to build one unit of housing in San Francisco right now. The sad truth is that $30 million would not go very far. We are dreaming big, and we are actually trying to move and generate an enormous amount of funding to bring to this crisis. And we see $6 million a year as sort of a small down payment on that to make sure that those funds get moved and they get moved in the way that's most effective that's going to get to the solution. Um, so I'll ask the President Trump question. And feel free to weigh in on this, too, um, as Yes. Um, uh, President Trump was recently, or yesterday. Uh, still here. He's still in the Bay. I thought he was oh, heading no, to no, LA. LA now. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, and has made some comments about cleaning up, um, in his words, homelessness um, in California. And they released a report uh, detailing what they address as, what his administration addresses as the root causes of homelessness um, and some ways to fix it. What did you make of his comments? Um, and what did you make of the report? I guess I now know how the climate scientists feel. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's really I, think, um, I think we can all agree that homelessness is an enormous problem. I mean, the question is the solutions. I was pretty surprised by some of their, um, some of their read of the literature, which really went um, pretty in pretty much opposition to what a lot of the literature says. I mean, one, you know, relatively small thing, but it really stuck out at me is they, um, basically leaned in hard against something called permanent supportive housing. Permanent supportive housing is um, housing where you subsidize the housing, you provide access to services, the services are voluntary. It's directed at the highest need people, people with chronic homelessness and severe behavioral disabilities. And it has been shown again and again and again and again such that we don't need more studies, that about 85 to 92 percent of people who enter this are successfully housed. It has broad bipartisan support. It's been the sort of law of the land for many years now because of the incredible evidence base of how effective it is. And they sort of came out against it, suggesting a reversion to what it replaced, which had success rates more in the sort of 5 to 10 percent range. So that was just one piece of many things that just felt like, oh, gosh, let's not go back there. We have something that works. Why are we not leaning into what works instead of reversing it? Um, actually, I, I did. I meant to ask you this during the earlier segment. Do you have some reaction to President Trump's comments? Well, I think the solution to homelessness is housing, not sweeping people into an airplane hangar. 
Succinct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mayor Chef re- referred to this uh, sort of myth busting on homelessness um, uh, during her time, but I want to ask I want to ask you about this as as well. Um, is California homelessness problem predominantly an economic problem, or is it predominantly about mental health and uh, and drug use? It's predominantly and wholeheartedly an economic problem. It's a problem of economic inequality, the lack of development of affordable housing, and um, and racism and structural racism. I think we can't get away from this conversation without acknowledging that black Americans are at four times increased risk of homelessness nationally. In the Bay Area, it's actually worse. I think you know right now, fewer than 6% of the San Francisco population identifies as black American, 37% of the homeless population. This is, this is what happens when you have a society where um, because of racism, a group of people are excluded from housing, they're excluded from employment, they're excluded, they are treated differently by the criminal justice system when you have really wide imbalances in income. Um, I, you know, people always talk to me about mental health and substance use, and for a while I was like, oh, I'm a physician, that, that's what they think I want to talk about. But now I realize people have the misperception that that's the cause of this problem. We know how to treat mental health and substance use disorders. There is nothing about mental health and substance use disorders that makes it impossible for someone to be housed. Most people with severe mental health and substance use disorders are housed. It's certainly a risk factor. It's a disability that makes everything harder. So why wouldn't it make housing harder? But we know how to treat it. We know how to treat it. What we can't do is treat it when people are on the street. And another thing, you often hear people saying, well, of course, California has a high homeless population. The weather's great here. Um, you know, what do you think when you hear that argument? Um, the weather isn't so great today, but <laughs> <laughs> I think um, that that um, really just, it's it sort of, we, we say in medicine all the time, like, correlation doesn't equal causality. Like, yeah, the weather is better here, but that's not why we have a homelessness problem. We have a homelessness problem because we have an extraordinary shortage of affordable housing. Nationwide, it's estimated that there are only 35 units of housing available and affordable for every 100 extremely low-income households. In California, that's at 22. Nevada is the only state that's worse than we are. That's why we have such a bad homelessness problem. I would say the other thing is that our problem is more visible because we do not, we have chosen and we don't have a lot of shelter. New York, um, I'm from New York, I was just there on Monday. Um, New York has a higher proportion of their population homeless than San Francisco does. It's just that in New York, 95% um, have shelter they're still homeless. They still have all the problems of homelessness. They're just sort of out of sight in San Francisco and in, in the Bay Area. About um, 67% are unsheltered. So speaking of New York, New York has right to shelter. I was wondering if you could explain what exactly that means. It's also been recommended, at least initially, by some members of uh, Governor Newsom's new task force on homelessness. I want to get your thoughts as to whether you think right to shelter is a good solution for homelessness in California. As as a member of that council, I just want to clarify that I was not one of those people that supported that. No. Yeah. So um, right to shelter uh, came about in about the 70s from legal action that like in New York City, for instance, if you are homeless, you have a right to ask for and sort of and, and to receive shelter, not housing but shelter. And um, I think, you know, in the 70s, it seemed like a really good idea. I think it has created some problems um, that when you actually speak to the folks in New York, most of them are saying, oh, please don't don't do what we did. I think that there's, there's no question that we need more shelter, but we need the type of shelter that is a pass-through, that, that people go into shelter, it's a brief stabilizing moment on the way to housing. The problem, I think, that Right to Shelter has created is it's created a sort of unending cycle where it's estimated nationally it's about 25 grand a year to provide a unit of shelter. In uh, New York, it's about 30 grand a year. It would probably be more similar to that. You could get a lot of housing for that if you sort of planned for it and did it. And so no question we need more shelter, but we need the type of shelter that is a conduit to housing, and we really need to not stop pushing on housing. That's where the answer is. So it's not the most efficient and optimal use of resources. So what is something from your research that you think people would be surprised to know uh, that solves, helps solve homelessness? So I think, I think as Mayor Schaff said, there, it, there needs to be right, different strategies for different people. You know one homeless person and you know one homeless person. But I think we can talk about you know, the folks who people are often most worried about 
are the folks with severe behavioral disabilities. We already know what works for them, and that is this model of deeply subsidized housing. So people pay 30% of what their income is. So if it's zero, it's zero um, on the housing. And you have an array of services that are voluntary. And those services serve, in my mind, as like the disability accommodation. I like to think of them as the same way as I would think of a wheelchair ramp. When someone has behavioral disabilities, they may, may need some help. They may need counseling. They may need substance use treatment. The reason why it's important that it's voluntary is that people need to be engaged in those services and they need to come from a, a place of safety. And when people are outside, they're not in a place of safety. And has forcing it turns out forcing people to take those services doesn't work terribly well. If you create a place of safety and a creative homeless and then you give the services and have them available, people will avail themselves of them and heal. I think for many, many more people, it's just a question of housing, and that is the development of housing. I think we're gonna hear a lot more talk than we've heard recently of things like shallow subsidies. I would love to see everyone have a, um, a Section 8 voucher or um, a housing choice voucher, which is, you know, it caps what you pay for 30% that come from the federal government. Right now, only one in four households in the country who qualifies them gets them. Would love to see a lot more of it. But I think we're also going to see a lot of action on the fact that a lot of people are $200 short of their rent and that maybe what they need is that $200 subsidy or a $400 subsidy to keep them in it. I think we need a lot more work on prevention too and of like basically making sure that someone doesn't lose their housing for want of $1,000. Just to push on this a little bit, if we know what works, then why are the numbers increasing at the rate that they are? Is the answer just more of what you just said? Yeah, I mean, we know what works. We're just not doing it enough. And the reason we're not doing it enough is actually usually, for instance, for supportive housing, the big barrier is the housing and not the services. The services are Medicaid funded. We can usually get them. We're not doing it because we don't have it. And let me just clarify, we're getting people out of homelessness at probably at rates that we've never done before. But for every one person we're getting out, two to three new people are becoming homeless. That is our challenge. Um, what do you think of the tough sheds? I think of... Um, Community cabins. <laughs> Community cabins. I think in that there's this model of people go in, they have safety, and I can't emphasize enough having that, you know, pets, uh, pets person, like your partner, pets partner, and privacy and possessions are really important. I think in the sense that they're a way for people to get in out of the cold, go someplace where they're safe, and be directed towards housing, that's the type of shelter in that we need more shelter we need. We need shelter that people feel safe in, because people don't make bad decisions. Like they're not going to go someplace if it feels less safe than what they're coming from. Um, but they also, we need to be able to get people, get figure out what benefits they're eligible for, help them, you know, go to get, um, meet a landlord and to do those services. And so having sort of temporizing measures that direct people to housing that are not seen as the end all and be all is the way we need to go. And just to clarify, each one of those communities comes with a budget of flexible rapid rehousing money. They're place-based, so we actually bring the community to an existing encampment area. So that is part of what makes the barrier much lower for people to come in. But we also provide funding to get them out. And not all shelters do that. Uh, so now, Margo, you're the Empress of California. And you have your magic wand or low rent genie. Um, what, what's the one thing you can do, what would do to fix California? Well, I didn't realize Prop 13 was on the, on my array of choices. Yeah, there's a and, genie. And, of course and, it is. I, right? It is a genie. And yeah. being that this problem is more than anything else, a problem of funding, I would have to go with that. All, All right. right. Well, thanks. Thank you. And now let's welcome up, uh, Candace Gonzalez. Nice guess. Hi there. I'm ready to be roasted. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Should I just say first yes. that I'm really excited to be here with Mayor Libby Schaff because I actually had my roots in Oakland. Um, I grew up in Alameda in Oakland as a first generation immigrant from the Philippines. Um, we got evicted over $70 at one point, but I also understand the benefit of stable housing because that led us to hard work and education. My sisters and I all went to college and I wouldn't be here today if not for that. 
And by today, I mean working with a company like Sand Hill Property Company, where we are trying to do big things when it comes to housing. Two notable, notable projects, I have to give a shout out to my sure. company. Um, we're the largest provider of rent-controlled housing in the peninsula with over 1,800 units in East Palo Alto. I'm not sure if anyone knows that. Um, we purchased that site several years ago. And now we're trying to go big with 2,402 housing units in Cupertino, 50% affordable. And I'm not going to say we're trying. We are going to go big. <laughs> you took our first question. Oh. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sorry. Uh -huh. So, so yeah, that was we were going to ask. I mean, we, we, yeah. we had learned, you know, you're in the few developers out there, likely who had the experience of being evicted yourself. And anything which you more to emphasize or explain about how that shaped your perspective on on housing issues, and also right. how Oakland has changed since you were a kid. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing amazing things with all the cranes going up. When I do go back to Oakland, because I still have family there, and in Alameda, you also see the tent city. So we know that something needs to be done, and we really need to do it together as partners. We see great mayors like Libby Schaff and Mayor Licardo going big, but we see many cities not doing its fair share. So we really need big solutions coming from the state. So we're going to start passing around the cards. So if you have cards or ideas, uh, please... Uh, uh, Submit them. Um, so you're a builder. Um, we constantly hear how hard it is to build in California. One, do you agree with that? I bet you're going to say yes. And then two, um, why? Why is it so difficult? Sure. I agree with that with an exclamation point times 10. Um, there's just so many roadblocks to building housing and affordable housing. Um, you know, it's indicative at the local level, just too many roadblocks. I had a project back in 2013 when I was with Palo Alto Housing Corporation, a nonprofit affordable housing developer. We were building a 60 unit affordable housing project on almost three acres, four stories next to eight stories, and it got referended and overturned by the ballot box. So that's how painful it is. It takes too long and too many ways to block it and too many ways to increase the cost of construction. So we hear a lot about a construction labor shortage or construction costs rising as a result of that or other reasons. Um, how much has a labor shortage manifested itself in, in, in your projects and what, what could be done about that? Sure. I mean, there is labor shortage. Construction costs are going up um, in Valco Cupertino. We ha we're seeing $700,000 per day in hard cost escalation. Per um, day? Per day. What does that mean exactly? What's hard cost escalation? Um, construction costs, uh, materials, ev everything going up daily. I mean, I think we're seeing construction costs rise by about 24%. So it's a $4 billion project. And I think, you know, the opposition hopes that they just delay it enough that it kills it. Um, we've, we've heard a lot about prefab housing as a possible solution to get at some of those construction costs that you reference. Um, we've also heard of it in, in terms of a solution for housing for people experiencing homelessness. I'm curious to get your thoughts as to whether you believe that's the future of construction. Um, sure. I think we have to be creative when it comes to construction and continue to explore all opportunities and um, including prefab housing. We're certainly looking into it. Um, you know, we've talked to different developers that have done it. We haven't seen the savings in money yet, talking to other developers, but, you know, it'll improve at some point, and I think we have to look at all solutions for sure. And just for, I mean, I'm betting most of you actually already know this, but prefab housing, they build it all off-site, and then they basically stack it like Legos. Um, and there's a project going up in Oakland, uh, too, I think, yeah. We were on the bar. We took the bar in today, and yeah, there it was, right? <laughs> like, Ooh, that was <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Candice, your firm is probably best known right now for its involvement in the Valco uh, development, as you've mentioned in Cupertino. What lessons have you drawn from this process about uh, about how difficult it's been it's been to build there? Sure. First of all, we're utilizing SB 35. That's our approval. Um, we've learned that we really need the state to step in because state preemption of local control is often necessary when the community is not doing what it needs to do. When the mayor says that we need to build a wall around the city at the expense of its Latinx neighbors. When the when a planning commissioner re recently said that $24 million to kill affordable housing is well worth it. We need state law to step in. But I do want to uh, say that we give a lot of credit to our local support. Over the last several years through this process, we've seen a rise in people supporting us. They really want to see the project done. So there's been a rise with the yimbyism to 
counteract the NIMBYism and other housing advocates. So I think uh, you know we've done a lot of community outreach and we do have a lot of players out there. I just don't want it to, I think the NIMBYism is trying to overshadow that right now, but yeah. So I've made this joke on the podcast before. We'll see how it lands in front of a, a live audience. This so. is going to be the developer yeah, you're cartoon you're joke. You're oh, ruined it. It's not that good. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Stepped on the joke. This is the, go ahead. Better not get more laughs for that than my actual joke. Uh, so when you watch movies and the movies have Muppets in them, um, the the villain often it, working to destroy the Muppets is often a developer. Um, and see, no laugh. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Shea. Appreciate it. So, 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 why do you think developers have this quite literally cartoonishly negative um, opinion uh, in the, among the general public, and, and how justified is that? And how hard, how much harder does it make it to do the job that you want to I'm, do? I'm laughing because the other villain is a politician. <laughs> I, I would actually. Um make the developers the angels. <laughs> I, I think it's difficult. Everyone assumes developers are all about the money and all about the greed. And obviously there's a for-profit economic reason to doing the housing. Um, but the bottom line is we are trying to help with production protection, preservation, um, so it shouldn't be villainized. I think right now in some of the communities, the villains should actually be the some of the city council members, not Oakland, not San Jose, and, and you know exceptions here and there, but I think um, that's probably a myth. Um, so there, there's obviously some levity with that, as Liam tried to exploit. Um, <laughs> but I, I honestly think this is a real political problem because um, people, uh, and especially voters, do not trust anything that comes out of a developer's mouth. They really don't. I was doing a forum in Berkeley um, for KQED, and these are NPR listeners, and you consistently hear, well, I don't believe that the developer is going to do what they say they're going to do. So how do you fix that? How do you solve that? What, what strategies do you employ to actually change that reputation? Sure. I think when you go into a community, you, rel you definitely need community support. So I think it's process, um, community engagement, making sure you have your local partners. I think, for example, in East Palo Alto, we bought the site probably close to five years ago, and we're starting a redevelopment process, but it took us about three years. We decided not to do anything for at least three years until we really got to know the community, engage them, the community, make sure that there's trust. So it does take time to build that trust, and you have to be a patient developer with some heart. So I think, you know, Sandhill, we're an enlightened developer. <laughs> So you're a veteran of building subsidized affordable housing. Um, what's the best thing that Mayor Schaff can do to meet her affordable housing goals and Oakland's affordable housing goals? Well, I mean, I think she knows the problems, right? We, we need the four Ds to build it. You need the dirt, the dollars, the density, and the determination. I think you have some of that, but you need the, the dollars probably. So um, we're happy to see some of the bills come that can help all of that. So, so are, are those state dollars that we're talking about or local dollars or... I'll take them from wherever I can get them. <laughs> All um, of the above. Yeah, and I just want to acknowledge that the private sector is starting to recognize that they have got to be part of the solution. Um, when we have companies like Kaiser Permanente stepping up and creating a $200 million fund, not all of which will be philanthropic. A lot of it is just going to be in a revolving loan fund to provide you know, patient, low-cost capital, particularly for workforce housing. And when I say that, I mean housing that's affordable to people that are making you know, between 80 and 120% of the area Median, median income, you know, your teachers, your nonprofit workers, probably some of my city workers, um, the, the, the employers need to recognize that they need to help create housing for their own employment base. Could I give an example? Again, in East Palo Alto, we're doing a redevelopment. We are voluntarily replacing the rent controlled units with brand new rent controlled units at the same rent. So we're realizing that we have to all be part of the solution. I mean, at Balco, we're doing 50% deed-restricted affordable, 80% or below AMI. So we all have to do our share for sure. And that, that was required as part of getting the approval process under the state law. Yes. Yeah. It was required, but, you know, we are we're going to do it. Um, I think, you know, some people were claiming that it's infeasible or not economically possible to build, and it's a challenge, but we are going to do it. Um, is your project in Cupertino going to change Cupertino? For the better. <laughs> in what ways? Cupertino doesn't have a downtown, for, for example. Um, it's going to add housing. There's only 140 
47 deed restricted rental units in Cupertino in a community of about 60,000 people. And all of those units are about to expire um, its affordability in the next 10 years, something that crazy, um, in a community of 60,000. So I think it's gonna improve it. It's gonna be make, make it more socioeconomically diverse. It's gonna bring workers, allow workers to live in the community they work. I mean, Apple opened a few years ago the spaceship with about 12,000 employees, so we need the housing. It's going to make it more vibrant. Um, yeah, that's going to make it. So in the, the as the current plans, the, the building heights are over 20 story? Uh, what? Yeah, 240 to 300 feet. Right, so significantly higher than anything. Beautiful. Right, <laughs> than right. anything in Cupertino and the surrounding you know, area, right? And so um, I'm asking about, you know, for a community to have it that kind of that quick of it, that much of a change that quickly, do you think that's a sustainable model for kind of the growth that the state may, may, may be pushing for? I think we need solutions to happen quickly. It's been decades long of not providing enough housing. So we need to be able to go big, uh, you know, when, when there is an opportunity. In Cupertino, we have 51 acres. So it's an opportunity to go big. And why waste that opportunity? There's going to be transitions into the single family neighborhoods that that needs to be preserved, but it's gonna become a vibrant urban village. And I think we really need to look at um, changing the models of you know, suburban suburbia. Um, what's a bigger obstacle uh, for your job, um, zoning laws or the California Environmental Quality Act? Well, with SB 35, we're exempt from CEQA. So I think zoning laws in general, um, and I think really just the road blocking by um, the community and some of the politicians is really the challenge. So let's give you the emperor's question. Mm -hmm. um, what's the one thing that you think uh, uh, you, or you would do if you were in charge of the state? Sure, I would um, have a moratorium on nimbyism. Until <laughs> <laughs> we can build the three and a half million homes. Because How would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I'd let all the projects come through without <laughs> o overnight, <laughs> uh, without letting it get bogged down in design review and planning, you know, planning commission, um, talking about traffic and density, everything, you, you know, when a community says, I support affordable housing or I support housing, but they add a but to it, that but is what kills it. So I would take out all the buts. <laughs> no buts. <laughs> no buts. <laughs> All right, to the lightning round. Yeah, so we have these questions, and I have some really good ones now, but we're going to do some. Thank you. Yes, we're going to do some fun paddle <laughs> lightning round questions. Uh, yes, that's yours. Yeah. yeah we've got extra. Oh, okay, extra paddles. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. I was. <laughs> Put that off for a second. Yes. So <laughs> we'll take them home. Right. <laughs> so some yes or no questions. Uh, obviously, green check mark. Yes. Um, thank you for demonstrating. Uh, <laughs> you know, red, red X. No. Uh, so and remember which direction is yeah. pointed yes. to the camera. Yeah. Yes. Not to us. Yeah. So uh, first question: um, the state's new rent cap, which caps annual rent increases at five percent uh, plus inflation, um, is not tight enough. <laughs> uh, so of course the developer yes says no, no right? <laughs> but, but we support yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's move to the next. So lightning. wait, so two yeses, one no. The yes. developer says no. Okay. Yeah. A fairly predictable yeah. outcome there. <laughs> yes. Um, we will see a decline in the statewide homeless count within five years. <laughs> Going to be optimistic. Uh, oh, uh, so two yeses and Mayor Chef no. Why not? It's, we have so much work to do. Um, and and we, because we cannot, the, our limitations on the use and value of private property is a huge driver of this. I don't think that's gonna change that much in five years. Um, I guess I could be happy if we s stabilized or stopped. I wanna be hopeful, but um, I also wanna be realistic. This is a very hairy problem. And Margo, why were, why were you optimistic? I think it's as much um, hope over realism, um, <laughs> but but I do think that there is so much more increased attention on it, and I see a lot of activity at the state that I'm hoping is going to translate into 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 some ability to. I don't think we'll be dramatically lower, but I think we'll be able to stop the increases and hopefully go down a bit with all the activity at the state level. And 
And if you ask me that question with 10 years, then I would be a yes. I think five years is too short. Go for it. Here's a good one um, that I'm sure you get all the time, because we certainly do. Um, building new market rate housing increases rents in the neighborhood in the neighborhood surrounding the new housing. So that's strong, nose across strong the board. No. Yeah. yeah. So, but just to push on this, um, you know, you mentioned the cranes in the sky in Oakland, which in addition to being a great song is obviously something that people, you know, <laughs> you think about and see, right? Um, so when people see that and they see that the housing is not for, for them and they see rising homelessness numbers. And so how do you, um, uh, how, how do you convince people of that? By coming on silly podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Do, do you, but a, a bit more seriously, do, <laughs> and, you know, silly is a compliment. I'll take it. I'd rather, yeah, I think I'd, that rather take silly than wonky. Right. Um, but, um, you know, there is very good research that shows that at an aggregate level, um, you know, more building does ameliorate uh, housing costs, but at a neighborhood level, the, the, you know, there's not as good research and information. So how, you know, how confident can anybody be about this? Well, I don't know if anyone can be confident about anything in the California housing market, but when you have good protections, when you have rent control, when you have just cause eviction, when you're serious about those, when you enforce them, when you educate people about their rights, and again, when you build the new housing for the new people, they aren't going to push out the people who are there. And again, just this equation, income inequality plus insufficient supply of housing equals displacement. And so we have got to address, we are not doing a good job of addressing income inequality right now. So we've got to try and do everything we can on this housing supply side. Um, okay, last lightning round question. Um, Governor Newsom will reach his goal of 3.5 million new housing units <laughs> by 2025. <laughs> Oh man, nose across the Animus board. Knows. And, and we got some laughter. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But that doesn't mean you should not have bold goals. I, I actually love this governor and the job he's doing. Uh, I feel like he's had a level of courage and clarity that was not coming out of the, as much as I love my former boss, Jerry Brown, it was not coming out of the governor's office before. So I do not want to ever criticize anyone for being ambitious and bold and clear. So that is what we need. Um, it's a goal to reach for. I do think because he has set that goal, we will do a hell of a lot better than we would have done if he did not set that goal. Is that fair? Completely just... agree. He just needs a little bit more time. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Should we do some audience yeah, questions? Some audience you questions. got one lined up? I do, I do. And okay. this speaks to something that we've uh, kind of talked around. Um, uh, tenant protections in the, in the law uh, are, this is the question, are important, but what is being done so that they are enforced, so that those laws have teeth? And if you could sort of speak particularly to this recent rent cap, um, unlike in cities that have rent control, there's no rent board at the state level. Are you, do you, to kind of piggyback off this, are you concerned that the rent cap uh, will not be able to be enforced because of it? You know, in general, I went from being a legislator to an executive, and it was a rude awakening. Um, and we do, I, I think the question raises a very important point that often laws are only as good as the paper they are written on. That if they are not enforceable, if it is not easy for people to know about them and understand them, they're not going to have their intended impact. And so I think it's a very um, critical time for people to step forward with maybe even philanthropically funded resources around tenant education, enforcement. Cities like Oakland already have some of those mechanisms in place, but it is very important for this to work that we need to bring that second piece. Do, do you expect your rent renter board uh, to be able to either hear complaints about the state law or how do you see those things interacting? Again, we're fortunate that we have a board. Right. We right. have a department. Uh, we are working, you know, with technology to improve our capacity to example, take more forms, complaints, et cetera, online so that we can actually um, increase our throughput uh, as well as add more transparency to our process. I think those are some opportunities for improvement. But, you know, particularly, uh, you know, people are being terrorized right now. Um, our tenants that are undocumented, the, the, the disincentives of them coming forward to complain to their government, we have to really be aware of the reality in which these laws are working. 
Um, this audience question is for Dr. Cushel. Uh, this one, in, in our parlance, a softball, knowing your research. Can you speak about senior, homeless, senior homelessness and what we should do to keep older adults in their homes? Sure. So people may be aware that the um, the age of the homeless population is increasing dramatically. Turns out people born in the second half of the baby boom, about 55 to 64, have been an elevated risk of homelessness their whole lives. So as they age, the population is aging. Um, in the next, until 2030, we're going to see a tripling in the number of people over 65. Although when we talk about senior homelessness, we actually talk about 50 and over. And that's because we have found that by the time people are in their 50s and 60s, have lived lives in deep poverty and are um, homeless, uh, they they are more like people in their 70s and 80s in terms of their health and things like that. It is um, it is this uh, really big problem that's about to come, and I feel like if you think the problem is bad now, just, just wait. Um, I think we need to do a couple things. One is our research has found that half of those folks had never been homeless before the age of 50. If you make it to 50 and you've never once been homeless and you become homeless, your homelessness is not a result of your mental health or substance use disabilities. This is why we really need to double down on prevention and um, really figure out how to keep those folks where they are because once they become homeless, it becomes much harder. And then I think we need to adapt our models. The Perhaps the bright side of it is as people get older, things like substance use behaviors tend to decrease just naturally. And the problem is less a problem of housing people with significant substance use disabilities and more a problem of housing people with increased sort of age-related disabilities, things like dementia walking problems and things. And so we really need to adapt our housing, our homelessness systems and our affordable housing systems to allow people to age in place. Remember that the state holds most of the risk for nursing homes because most of it is paid for by Medicaid um, and, and comes through sort of state budgets. And so the state is going to have a really big incentive to get this right. So one thing we haven't mentioned, and probably to our detriment at this point, is uh, uh, so I'm glad someone in the audience asked, um, could anyone speak to the role of transportation, particularly uh, public transportation, uh, that, that it could and should play in solving the housing crisis? OK. Um, well, I think it's so important that we recognize the inextricable link between the housing crisis and our transportation systems. Uh, where jobs are located relative to housing and the transportation systems that allow people to move from housing that is affordable to jobs that pay them, <laughs> their, th that gives them the ability to afford that housing, uh, and the cost of transportation, and the cost not just financially, like w what I'm paying in gas and wear and tear in my car or my BART ticket, which is getting more expensive, uh, versus the psychological cost of super commuters. The fact that people are not with their children anymore. The fact that people um, are now picking up Uber and Lyft driving, which is another transportation issue uh, to make ends meet. Um, we have to see these things as integrated systems. And I am excited, uh, you know, one, one, I think, failure in the Bay Area, and now I am going to wonk out a little bit, is we are one of the few regions that had separate regional bodies that one handled housing, long-term housing planning, and a different body has handled long-term transportation planning, MTC, transportation, ABAG housing, and other types of planning. Well, there is a movement afoot to merge those bodies together. I would just theor theorize that the separation of those bodies has been part of our problem of not seeing these things as integrated. Uh, interesting, the state Senate has moved in exactly the opposite direction, divorcing their housing and transportation committees. But I wanted to um, actually piggyback on this question for, for you, Candice. Um, uh, what obligation does a developer have for transportation to accompany a new housing project? And maybe if you could speak specifically to um, your plans in Cupertino. Sure. I think we have to look very closely at the jobs, the housing, and the transportation. Um, you know, obviously, with every project, you have to do a whole, um, you know, impact analysis and see what you need to do, whether it's um, providing VTA eco passes or SAM trans, um, working with the transport, public transportation, the bus system near close to your projects. With affordable housing, you always have to score your projects anyway. And you have to make sure you're near transit. So um, doing things like, you know, the resurgence of SB 
50 um, that looks at jobs and housing and transportation closely together. Um, it's, it's very important because you want to help improve the lives of everybody that's commuting and that's on the roads and that's working, bring jobs close, bring housing closer to jobs, bring the transportation closer to the housing. It has to all be linked. Can I throw something in here? Because I think this is going to be really interesting. You all know that there is uh, movement underfoot to create a big mega measure around transportation for the ballot. In long, the Bay Area. In the Bay Area. Bay Area only. It's called Faster. Um, it's really big priority for like a second BART crossing to link our train systems, regional rail, help coordinate all of our bus systems. Good stuff. You're going to hear a lot of talk, though, about employers have got to play a role in this and actually start managing the transportation of their employees, whether that's through bus passes or, um, you know, facilitating carpooling, that, that we, the employers have got to not just keep their heads in the sand, sorry, Sand Hill, uh, in the sand about, like, I'm just going to plant, you know, 12,000 jobs in Cupertino and there's no affordable housing around it and there's no good public transit to get there, but that's not my problem. So I just, I think let's say like, you're going to hear a lot more talk about this in the coming year. It's good. And I good think talk. we see more TDM plans happening with projects too. So T what's tell TDM? Everybody what TDM is. Um, yeah. Tra acronym. <laughs> <laughs> Transportation demand management, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, I got another one for uh, Dr. Cashel. Uh, will expansion of California's conservator, conservator, conservatorship sorry, laws provide meaningful relief for our unhoused neighbors who suffer from mental illness and substance abuse disorder? And, and if you could explain the word that I just fumbled over. <laughs> uh, the conservatorship. So conservatorship are um, a set of laws that basically allow people to be um, effectively held against their will to receive treat, to, to be brought in for care. Um, and I would say, you know, California has two pretty strong laws. Um, one is for mental health disabilities. One is for dementia or cognitive disabilities. There is a trial um, in, in about five counties of an expansion of that. The way it's written, it doesn't actually affect that many people. And um, as you can imagine, these laws are really difficult and controversial and they're difficult on the on the ground when you're tasked with enacting them with sort of taking away someone's liberties um, in the view of um, giving them care. It's something that the health system takes very seriously um, and in part because when you do that you have often lost so much trust with the person that, that you have to decide that the, that the benefit outweighs that dramatic loss of trust, which can take years to rebuild. So it's a really complicated, highly emotional question. I think I would more focus on the fact that are we optimally using the systems that we have and the laws that we have? There was a lot of fighting over this expansion when you looked on the ground on how many people it actually applied to, it was vanishingly small um, because most of the people who it applied to could have been covered under some of the existing laws if they needed. Um, I think most mental health um, folks will tell you that, um, that sometimes it's needed. Like sometimes someone is like a grave danger to themselves and they really are not able to make a safe decision and they need to be cared for, um, but you really want to take that really seriously. Um, I think a lot of the law was thought, a lot of people's frustration was around people with multiple um, admissions, let's say, for a substance use disorder. And there's a really robust evidence that shows that forcing substance use treatment just has bad outcomes. So no matter what you think about it, if you're just going on what works, it doesn't work terribly well. I also think that a lot of the folks who who were really worried about and we see their behaviors likely probably have really significant cognitive impairment disabilities that we're not picking up on. And if we really thought that they needed help, we could help them through the other, the other existing laws because there is laws about cognitive impairment. I think the other really important point to know is that none of these things work unless you have a place to put people. If you're conserving them, you're assuming that you've got a facility or housing for them. And in my mind, those are the big roadblocks. So I would say let's fix those first and really optimize them and then talk about whether we need to expand them because we are we we have so many people who are not getting treatment because we don't have the, the treatment available or the housing available once they're done. So it wouldn't be a public forum in the Bay Area without a question about universal basic income. Um, so... <laughs> 
So we got one. Here we go. Um, so there is an experiment going on in Stockton uh, right now, also on the presidential campaign trail. This has been brought up um, about sort of guaranteeing income to, to folks um, uh, every month. How much of a contribu positive contribution or negative contribution do you think that would be to the state's housing problems if that were in place? Oh, positive. Okay. Yeah, I like it. I, I like basic income. I think it is definitely an idea that's worth testing. I'm actually disappointed because Y Combinator was originally doing a basic income experiment in Oakland, but they decided to move it after kind of this initial period to, um, I think it was somewhere in Michigan. But uh, I, I think it makes sense. Uh, the income insecurity and, and vacillation that so many people have, it, it's almost like we don't need employment uninsurance insurance anymore. We need income insurance. And that and, and anyway, I, I think it's a good thing. Margo, from your... I, I mean, be, being that, um, you know, the primary problem here is that really it's not about mental health, it's not about substance use, it's about the ability to afford housing. Um, you know, I'm certainly not an expert in it, but I certainly think it's worth testing. Has, has there been any research on the, the tie between UBI and preventing homelessness? I know they're just getting started on this in Stockton, but that does seem like there is a connection there. I think there's been some research on like elevating the minimum wage, which is a different question. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not aware of um, UBI and homelessness directly. Um, research someone else, maybe. But you know, um, back in the day when housing was cheaper, we used to say like Social Security solved homelessness. Now Social Security no longer solves homelessness because the cost of housing has gotten so high. But we used to see that when people qualified for Social Security, they were able to exit homelessness. And we can't see that because of the cost of housing. Can I add another thing that I hope it solves is what I call tweezer government. So, you know, in homelessness, when you look at the kind of funding that the county gets, like, oh, I'm sorry I can't help you because you're not a, a veteran or you're not a single mother with a child under the age of five. Or, I mean, we have these categories of, of public funding and the amount of energy and bandwidth that we spend accounting to the funding source that we only spent this dollar on the absolute, you know, required thing, instead of recognizing that we have a whole lot of issues. And if we could just blend that funding together and be holistic in how we help all three of you, um, that's going to be so much more efficient. We'll actually have more money to put out into helping people instead of doing this crazy accounting. I mean, we have, you know, a food program and a housing program and, you know, everything is so divided up and accounted for. We, the, the, what I like about basic income is it recognizes, oh God, get over it. Just people are smarter than we give them credit for. Let them figure out how to help themselves. And it's not quite universal basic income, but it's this idea of these shallow subsidies that are flexible that I think we're going to start to see more of, of like people can get an extra $400 a month and they can pay their brother so that they can stay with their brother or they can pay their landlord or, you know, let people sort of solve it. It gets at a little bit of that flexibility. Um, one quick question for the developer here. Uh, developers often say that adding below market rate, so subsidized housing for low income Californians, uh, within or across multiple buildings doesn't pencil, which means it's not profitable for you guys to do so, um, and instead advocate for it being consolidated, do you agree? Kind of a trick question, because I come from an affordable housing background, so I, uh, so I completely support affordable housing, whether it's standalone or inclusionary. I think we have to look at all opportunities. So forcing inclusion doesn't always work, because you have an opportunity to go off-site, leverage more money, leverage more units. Um, sometimes it works on-site, sometimes it works off-site, so I think it needs to be flexible. So um, yeah, I, I support building affordable housing any which way you can. It does make it more complicated to do like a tax credit, low income housing tax credit project when it's inclusionary and it doesn't allow you to necessarily target the deeper affordability levels, but there's a time and a place just as long as there's um, flexible flexibility in the policies. Um, we actually had one last question for Liam, which is uh, you're moving to LA shortly. Yes. Um, one of our podcast fans actually flew here from Long Beach. He's an wow. ADU, ADU builder. He says, okay. do you need an ADU? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so uh, I, I currently live in Sacramento, uh, moving to LA at the end of this month for a new assignment. I'm still going to be covering housing, super pumped about that, but sort of more about individual experiences in neighborhoods rather than from straight policy and legislation and things like that. So very excited, although I am not excited when I found my new apartment in LA that my rent will be doubling. So <laughs> it's unfortunate. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. You got, Anyone you got have any, any parting, yeah, parting, parting shots comments? for our audience? Anything we did not ask about in our arrogance and ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I think we covered a lot of ground, actually. Yeah. Well, please uh, thank our help. Thank our guests here for a wonderful episode. <laughs> and thank you all for coming out and uh, listening to us. Yeah, this was fun. This is fun. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's not so sad.